Hello and welcome to United States History 12, and this is Lecture 5 in a series of lectures that will take us through 1877 to as close to the modern era as we can get. So, as last we left in our intrepid adventures through time and space, we had ended with the United States entering into the First World War. Well, the First World War, uh, you should take a look at in more detail. Um, with the previous lecture, I mentioned uh, World War I in color. You can also find a video entitled The Great War on YouTube as well. It will give you the American view of the First World War and the issues that will lead our nation into that war. Uh, as we are going through the 1920s, uh, there are a number of different videos that you can uh, watch to help expand your knowledge of this time. Very often in class, I show a good many videos, but unfortunately, I don't have the ability to do that. And if I did, I'd be a little reluctant to do so because... Showing them in class is one thing. Showing them on YouTube is something quite different, as there are uh, individuals who look for copyright infringements in various different videos. And if I were to show videos on this particular format uh, without the licensing for those videos, even for educational purposes, I'm not sure if YouTube would be terribly happy about that and getting a copyright strike would mean removal of the video and that would be a very bad thing as these are supposed to be for your class and you, it's part of your grade. So I don't want them removed so unfortunately I can't show a lot of videos that I would be showing in class. So I'll make mention of some of them, not all of those that I generally show in class. And hopefully you, as you will have a good deal more time on your hands, uh, will be able to go through and see them for yourself. All right, so the United States enters into the uh, First World War, and it's not long after that it's over. Now, there are a number of different reasons why this is the case, when only uh, a few months before Germany, Imperial Germany, having defeated Tsarist Russia, will begin to pull its forces to the west, and uh, with renewed energy and power and strength, they will begin to hammer the West. And uh, it looked as if the Germans might win. But with the United States entry into the war, a uh, flow of uh, more and more American soldiers will be coming in, as well as a great many more uh, products from the United States will begin to flood in for the Allies to use during the war. And uh, with all of that, there is renewed hope on the parts of uh, the Allied forces of the French and the uh, British. And there are other things as well that contribute to the victory for the Allies, and that is, uh, amongst other things, some technological advances, one of the most important of which is that of the tank. Tanks make trench warfare virtually um, obsolete, as tanks can roll through these particular areas with their uh, protected uh, armament, and they have uh, cannons and they also have machine guns and they can roll through uh, barbed wire and mines and all kinds of different things. So it, it's, a, it's a massive game changer as well. But the end of the war comes and with that there are a number of things that are going to happen 
And that, of course, is that there is going to need to be a uh, gathering of the nations to decide what it was that was going to happen. Now, the United States had entered into the war with Wilson's promise to the American people that this would be the last war the world would fight, that the United States was entering into this war to ensure that there would be no more wars, that Wilson and the United States would create things at the end of this war that would ensure peace, perhaps forever, hopefully forever. And as a result, Americans had firm faith and hope placed in Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points. Part of the other reason why Germany loses at this time is that there was hope with Wilson and America entering into the war with the promise that the end of the war, the uh, conference to end the war would be openly uh, presented and that uh, there would be no blame placed upon anyone. And Germany, having been just crushed during the war, the effort had been monumental for them. They were sick and tired of war and they wanted an end to it. So that's another reason why they will simply just give up as well. At any rate, uh, at the peace conference, it will be nominated not by the United States and Woodrow Wilson, but instead by France and Great Britain, Lloyd George and uh, Clemenceau. They will completely alter Wilson's hopes for what would happen at the end of the war. And Wilson's 14 points will go out the window. And Wilson will be more or less okay with this because... What he really, really believed in that was needed was a League of Nations, a place where nations could gather together, work out their differences, and if they couldn't, then other nations would say, hey, stop that or else. United, we will beat you up. So, for the League of Nations, uh, Wilson was willing to give up quite a bit. So the idea of removing all of Europe's colonial possessions went out the window, although Germany will lose its colonial possessions. Great Britain and France will retain theirs because, hey, they've been economically uh, devastated because of this war, so they need it. And, of course, uh, because they are so devastated, they're going to need money. Uh, getting reparations from a nation like, oh, I don't know, Germany would be a good idea as well, because Germany could now be blamed. A uh, dual monarchy, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, uh, the Austrian Empire, was no more. It had been fractured by the end of the war itself, so it no longer existed. You can't blame them anymore. So you got to blame somebody. Get those reparations payments. Get that money from to pay for uh, the widows and orphans and the injured soldiers and to fix all of the damage that had been done primarily in uh, northern France. All of this, you get money from Germany. It still existed. So, uh, Wilson will allow all of this to happen. Of course, this will also lead inevitably to the Second World War because of all of the guilt placed upon Germany, all of the war reparations, all of this stuff. They do it to themselves. They create the Second World War, not knowing that it would happen, but nonetheless, it happens because of their actions. And Wilson is happy to allow this to happen. Well, not happy to allow, but he is accepting of it because he wants the League of Nations. But meanwhile, in the United States, not everybody is happy with what has happened. And in the mid-year elections of 1918, the American public, tired of the war, tired of the shenanigans that are happening in Europe at the end of the war, their hopes and dreams crushed, 
Uh, George Washington had been right. Don't trust those foreign entanglements. Europe will weave its sultry dance of intoxication and compel you to do what it wants to do and take from you everything in the process. And it kind of felt that way. So the 1918 mid-year elections, uh, we have the Republicans who will now take control of Congress. And they are not going to be happy about creating a League of Nations because they believe that, and others did as well, the League of Nations would subvert the authority of the United States. That the League of Nations, with its um, authority to tell other nations what they could and couldn't do, would mean that the United States would simply cease to exist as a sovereign nation and would be under the rule and control of the League of Nations. And we didn't want that. Why would we? We created our own country, very proud of it, very happy with the results. We don't want some other countries telling us what to do. So, Wilson, however, believed in it so much that he will take his proposal to the American people and tell them that they can get this done by compelling, by writing to their congressmen and telling them that it is something that they wanted. So he will go out and uh, he will speak before the public, but Wilson will suffer a stroke and he won't be able to carry this plan through and without his dynamic personality pushing it forward it will fail meanwhile woodrow wilson is in a very bad shape as a result of this stroke and probably a series of strokes that will leave him um, crippled, bedridden, and for about a year, year and a half of the remainder of his presidency, he will be so badly off that he won't be able to communicate with anyone except his second wife. At least she claims that she can understand him. No one else can, but she can. His second wife, uh, his first wife, Wilson's first wife, had died a couple of years into Wilson's presidency. He then, after a couple of years, will marry another woman, and she then is the one who will claim to be able to understand Wilson, interpret his mumblings, and be the de facto power of the presidency for about a year, year and a half. There are a number of people at that time and today who still believe that uh, Wilson should probably have been removed from office as he was incapable of fulfilling his duties. But uh, there were many who were enamored of Wilson at that time, and they didn't want his presidency to end on a note of his being removed from office because he was uh, unfit carry out the duties and responsibilities of the presidency. So they will allow him to remain in as president because, hey, his wife can uh, talk for him. So technically, uh, she is the reigning president of the United States at that time without the title. But by the 1920 election, Woodrow Wilson is unfit to run for election, and so the Democrats will choose a new candidate, a uh, individual governor of New York, James Cox, and another um, uh, member of Congress from New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The Republicans, on the other hand, will choose the... Uh, Um, oh, wait, uh, my apologies. Uh, Cox was actually the governor of Ohio. And Roosevelt is the assistant secretary of Navy at the time. 
very reminiscent of his uh, second cousin, Theodore Roosevelt. Warren Harding is an Ohio senator, and Calvin Coolidge was governor of Massachusetts. So, elections held, and most people want to go back to before the Democrats had seized control of the nation and had pushed a, uh, an agenda of cleaning up America. The, the reform agenda, reform America, make it better, make it purified, make it fit to be the leader of the world. Most people didn't care about the rest of the world. They only cared about the United States and how things were functioning here. So things were fine before the Democrats told them that it wasn't fine. So Harding will run on a platform of a return to normalcy. return to regular day-to-day -day life. Things were better in the past. Let's go there. Let's do that. Many Americans will agree with him. And Republicans will be in control of Congress and the presidency. So, what happens during the presidency of Warren Gamaliel? Harding. A number of different things. Uh, Harding is a uh, staunch Republican, believing in the federal government not really inserting itself very much into the lives of the average American citizen or into the affairs of the individual states believing that indeed this is a republic and that the states are, while not sovereign, they are um, allowed as much individual freedom and authority as they can under a republic. But one thing that he will do is to protect American businesses against the massive influx of goods flowing from Europe, uh, because Europe had been unable during the war to sell much in the United States. They had been warehousing much of their goods, and uh, it's expensive to warehouse those things. you got to get them empty, so they will just basically dump them onto American markets at lower than uh, what it costs them to manufacture them. So American businesses couldn't really compete with that. So in order for them to be allowed to do so uh, and allow American businesses to remain in business, the tariff will be raised. The tax on imported goods will be raised so that there isn't that much of a disparity then between the prices of the European goods and the American goods and American businesses can continue to operate. But this is also a period of time at the end of the First World War where the economy isn't doing all that great. Many of the wartime factories had shut down. The workers who had been getting uh, pretty good wages in those factories no longer have those jobs. And so there isn't a lot of money flowing in the economy. Plus, a number of unions are using this moment to push for uh, higher wages, better working conditions, all of this at a time in which really the nation couldn't really afford it. So a number of states will call out the militia and break these strikes. And some of the states will also call upon the federal government to assist them in doing so. Uh, union membership during this particular period of time goes down quite a bit. Not terribly surprisingly. But what Harding and his administration is most noted for are a variety of different scandals that will take place. One of which was the events that take place in the Veterans Administration. Under the leadership of Charles Forbes, Forbes will take the hospital supplies from the veterans' uh, hospitals and sell them 
and pocket that money. Of course, obviously, that's not just illegal. That's pretty much immoral as well, because those veterans need those supplies. Uh, Forbes, of course, is uh, going to pay for this. He'll be removed from office. Uh, I believe he flees to Europe. But there are more scandals. And uh, that is uh, the scandals of the Teapot Dome and the Elks Hills Reserves. Uh, Teapot Dome was in Wyoming. Elk Hills was in California. Both of these different locations had been uh, authorized by Congress to be set aside. These were known areas of uh, oil where they were set aside to be used in time of national emergency, such as war. However, the Secretary of the Interior and the Secretary of the Navy will conspire together to allow these places to instead be uh, used by private oil companies drill into the soil, take the oil out, sell the oil, make money. For this, the Secretary of the Interior and the Secretary of the Navy were both given money by these oil companies to do this. Again, illegal bribery. They will both be uh, convicted on these charges and spend time in jail for it. The individuals from the oil companies, however, being richer, have access to better lawyers. Lawyers will argue things like, well, they didn't know that they were being, uh, that this was a bribe, they thought it was a loan, uh, they were very happy to uh, use these, you know, all of this kind of legal ease. And uh, as long as you have the money to get the best lawyers, uh, the best defense, you can get away with murder. There's an old saying that goes, um, everyone is assumed guilty until proven rich. And uh, often that is the case. Guilty people can get off if they have good lawyers. Good lawyers don't come cheap. So, if you're poor, don't do any crimes. Tell you get rich, then I guess you can do whatever you want. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't do any crimes. Crimes are bad. Even if you're rich. Alrighty, so, uh, what else is there? Harding himself is not a party to any of these actions. But because he is the president, he's the guy who had selected these individuals for these positions, he is blamed for their actions, fairly or unfairly. Personally, I think it's a little unfair, but that's just my opinion. I mean, you... Anyway, um, Harding will be um, very upset over what had been going on, and he will try and fix it by going out to the American people and doing kind of campaigns, giving a number of speeches, telling people that he had no idea what was going on, that he was going to try and fix this, all of this kind of thing. And all of that exacerbates some of his underlying uh, physical poor health and he gets pneumonia, and he has a stroke, and, um, I'm sorry, a heart attack, and dies. So, there were at the time, and some people still believe in conspiracy theories, that Harding was actually poisoned. 
in order to end this whole fiasco as quickly as possible and usher in somebody who had a spotless reputation and a spotless record, the vice president. But uh, my recalling at this uh, particular juncture says that there is no supportive evidence of this. In fact, I think there was some kind of autopsy that was performed on Harding to see if uh, there were any poisons in him and none were found. So it's just more or less baseless rumor. But in any case, Calvin Coolidge will take the reins of government and become the new president of the United States. Calvin Coolidge, a man who some said at the time had the face of a child who'd been weaned on a pickle. Kind of a sour expression. But he was a uh, an individual who believed in the ideals of the Republican Party, keep government small, keep it out of the everyday lives of people to allow them the greatest potential for the most freedom. Regardless of how that may or may not impact their lives and to allow their states to have the uh, greatest power over their lives rather than the central federal government. Alrighty, so in 1924, Calvin Coolidge will win re-election and become president in his own right. So what are the things that will be accomplished during Coolidge's presidency? Well, there are a number of different things. The economy begins to really pick up during this time. I don't think you can say it's because of the Republican policies. Remember, the uh, federal government at this time is fairly small. State governments are, um, some of the larger ones at least, are very powerful in, uh, in many respects, more powerful than the federal government. But... Uh, the federal government does have a number of things that it can and will do. It's a period of time in which, under the Calabrian Pact, uh, ships, not only in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, will be reduced in size in order to create a kind of parity. Yet other nations, like Japan, will be allowed to raise the number of ships that they have available so that, again, there will be parity, there will be an equal number of warships that each nation will be able to have so that it will be less likely that one nation will go to war with another nation. Because if you can dominate another nation and it's easy for you to defeat them because of your naval force, uh, it would make it more likely that you would do that. But if you aren't sure that you could win because your naval force is the same as theirs, well, you're less likely to go to war with them. So that was the thinking behind this anyway. And because the economy is doing quite nicely at this time, the United States decided to reward its World War I veterans with an extra lump sum of money, but not at that moment. Instead, it would be in another 20 years in the future, in the 1940s. Money would be set aside, interest would accrue on it, the money would grow, and that would then be given to these veterans as a bonus for their effort in the First World War and also as kind of compensation for their being out of the loop, uh, getting in on the ground floor of this booming economy. Other events that will take place during Coolidge's presidency include, in 1923, the French invasion of the German Ruhr Valley, and this was caused primarily because the Germans were unable to make the reparations payments to France, France then will decide to take part of Germany, 
under their control. And this was a heavily industrialized region. So they could control it, make a little money on the side. No one said very much about it. No one did anything about it, at least, until the United States decided to do something. And that something will be the creation of the Dawes Plan. The Dawes Plan said that the United States and its economy was doing gangbusters. It was doing fantastic. While Europe's economy, because of the First World War primarily, and the devastation that it had wrought, was unable to stand on its own. And the United States would therefore come and help prop them up. What it would do under the Dawes Plan is it would loan money to Germany at interest, very small interest, of course, but at interest. Germany then would have the money to make its reparations payments. France and Great Britain then would have the money to build up its economy, and everybody would be happy. France and Great Britain could then repay the loans that it had uh, taken from the United States in the First World War. And again, the United States would get its money back. It would be a kind of a multiplier effect in which um, the United States could loan out money and it would come back to them in greater amounts. And it kind of worked out that way, more or less, at least for a while. Certainly, the economy in Europe will pick up things in Germany will start to look better, and the rest of Europe as well. All right. Um, in 1928, Coolidge will decide not to run for re-election, and instead the Republicans will choose Herbert Hoover. The Democrats will choose Alfred E. Smith, uh, the governor of New York. But it is Hoover and the Republicans who will win in the 1928 election, retaining control of Congress, retaining uh, the presidency. Herbert Hoover, uh, the 30th president of the United States, was born in Iowa in 1874. Both of his parents died when he was uh, about six years of age. And he'll have to go and live with his uncle. And his uncle was a, a miner. And when Hoover was old enough, he went into the mine as well. And here it was that he found out that uh, being a miner wasn't what he wanted for the rest of his life. Certainly, the pay wasn't all that great. There was dangerous work. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of respect for miners from pretty much anybody, except other miners, of course. But the people who did earn the respect in the mines were the mining engineers, the geologists, these individuals, the white-collar workers. So Hoover decided that... This is the direction he wanted to go in his life. So he'll save up money. Then he'll be able to head out to Stanford University, where he will eventually earn a degree in uh, geology and uh, get employment in a mining company and then work his way up through the corporate ladder until he becomes a... A partner in the mining company, which is an international company, and Hoover will spend a good deal of time in a number of other countries, uh, like China, for example, um, checking out the mining operations there. The thing that will bring him to the political notice is in the First World War, a number of Americans, including uh, diplomats, will be stuck in Great Britain and unable to leave. But Hoover, using his connections in the shipping industry, which you know, mining companies with an international aspect to it have shipping that uh, goes around the world, he will use those connections to allow those individual Americans trapped in Great Britain to return back home.
and uh, he'll earn a great deal of respect for that. And as a result, he will be placed in charge of relief efforts uh, in um, <coughs> excuse me uh, in the um, in Europe. And uh, after that, he will then wind up higher in political office until he winds up as the Secretary of Commerce. And it is from that position that the Republican Party will nominate him to become the next president of the United States. So what is it that will happen under Hoover's watch as president of the United States? Well, the most important thing, of course, and the one that uh, most people associate with him, is the Great Depression. The Great Depression really isn't something that he should be saddled with. But many do because it's, that's what they do. He shouldn't be because at this time, as I've said, the federal government is fairly small. Far, far smaller than it exists today, and therefore really didn't have a great impact upon the economy. Many large states had a greater impact on the nation's economy than the federal government did at that time. But in either case, it is uh, during Hoover's administration, his presidency, that the Depression happened. So let's take a look at what historians and economists and various others have postulated as to the root cause or causes of the Great Depression. People are very uh, keen on trying to figure this out so that they can create strategies to avoid it in the future. And for the most part, we have. So let's take a look at some of the causes of the Great Depression. Some have claimed that United States factories at the time had no understanding of the idea of what we know today as planned obsolescence, where you have a cycle of new products that come out and then they get old and you have a new cycle of new products. Oh, you got to get the new one, the new improved one, the better one. There was none of that. You made good products the best that you could at that time. You didn't add little incremental changes, little incremental additions to it to make people want to purchase it. It was the best you could do at that time, and you made it the best way that you could, so it lasted a good long time. Factories churned out as many of them as they could manufacture, rather than the idea that we have today where you manufacture to the need of the time. You don't overproduce. You make just enough to cover the demand of the public. But because they were producing as much as they could, when people finally had, when everyone had a new toaster, a new fan, a new radio, a new car, a new whatever, then the numbers of people buying them went down and down and down. And eventually, those companies that were manufacturing those products have to let people go. They close down their plants. And those people no longer have a job. They no longer have money to be able to pay for rent, to pay for clothes, to pay for extra stuff. And so other companies begin to go bankrupt because they have to close down because they aren't having their product sold. So it's kind of a multiplier effect that goes through like a wildfire eating the grass in the American economy. Others have pointed out that this is a period of time in which the concept of credit is introduced into America. The idea that you don't have to save up to buy something and pay cash and pay it completely off when you buy it. That you can, instead, have that new car, and that new radio, and that new electric 
uh, fan and the new electric uh, toaster and the new uh, electric um, uh, vacuum cleaner and all of the other little fun, exciting gadgets that enrich your life. Make it nicer, but aren't terribly essential. And that's all well and good, as long as you're working. You can make those payments to the credit card company. But when you're out of work, you don't have money, you can't make those payments, things get bad. Not just for you, but also for the companies that you were paying off that credit to, which were usually local companies, local businesses. So you'd go into a local store and say, hey, I'd like that uh, new radio. All right, dude, here's your credit. There you go. You get store credit for that particular local store. So if you can't pay those payments, that store doesn't have the money to be able to pay its employees or pay off its debts or anything, and it goes bankrupt. Its employees are done. And again, the multiplier effect in the economy occurs. This is also a period of time in which technology really begins to ramp up and machines begin to, in larger numbers, larger and larger numbers begin to replace American workers. Individuals who had been in generational jobs, their fathers had been in this job, their grandfathers had been in this kind of a job. And now they were. But now it's being replaced, that particular job is being replaced by a machine. You can't do that job anymore. What are you going to do? Well, retraining for another job really wasn't in the American consciousness at that time. And if you don't have the skills for another job, it's difficult to get a skilled job, which pays better. So you have to take an unskilled job, which pays less. So again, the economy just begins to dissolve. But the problem is Europe itself. Europe had never really recovered from the First World War, especially in France. Uh, the northern third of France had been devastated as a result of the war. The battlefields, uh, farms had been destroyed, mines, uh, railroads, all kinds of things had been destroyed in the northern third of France. Uh, lives had been shattered as well uh, throughout the European continent. People had been injured, unable to work as a result of this. Uh, factories had uh, been basically left to rot during the war. Uh, you, you couldn't uh, improve on them. You had to do what you had to do at that time. You had to stick with what you got because you couldn't afford to close down the factory, uh, retool it to improve it or make improvements because you had to keep everything rolling along 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it generally just kind of fell further and further back. And America was the one that had come to its rescue and propped it up. But when America has economic problems. It can no longer afford to give that money to Europe. So that money evaporates. And when Europe's economy evaporates, it takes America's economy down with it as well. Uh, Europe can't make its reparations payments. Uh, Europeans aren't going to be able to buy American goods. All of this kind of thing. Even Mother Nature seemed to be uh, in a conspiracy at this time, as the Midwest of the United States will suffer a devastating drought. To make matters worse, farmers at the time really didn't understand the weather conditions and the soil conditions of the area at the time, and they did uh, farming practices that today they don't do. Uh, they will use deep plows, for example, to bring up the richer soil from further underneath, but that makes the soil uh, looser, and uh, uh, winds come along and can pick that looser soil up and take it away. 
when the topsoil is gone, the fertility of that particular area is reduced. Uh, they also nowadays plant uh, lots, lots of trees uh, to serve as a kind of wind break. Didn't have those in those days, so winds could sweep for hundreds of miles across and pick up massive amounts of soil and deposit it all over the place. There are many photographs during this period of time of homes that are just buried beneath mountains of sand that have been deposited by these storms. So farmers can no longer afford to make their payments. They lose their farms. Uh, they lose their livelihoods. This is the period of time in which the so-called Okies will flee the Midwest and move to other states like California. They become migrant farmers because they really have no choice. And you see this uh, very well presented in uh, the book, The Grapes of Wrath, and the movie, The Grapes of Wrath. And if you haven't uh, read or seen the movie, then you read the book or seen the movie, then you should probably do so in order to give you a better view of what it's like in the 1930s. Uh, other difficulties are that when Europe begins to feel the financial pinch, its banking system will try to lure money away from American banks with American um, investors by having a higher interest rate. Put your money in our bank, we have a higher interest rate, you'll make more money in our bank. Problem is that when those European banks go bankrupt, as they will, it takes all of that American money down with it. It just disappears, like the banks that disappear in the United States. But at a time in which those banks in America could have used that money to help support farmers, to give them loans to carry them over to another year or two or three or however long it took to recover from this great drought. They didn't have it because the investors had their money in European banks instead. So uh, another problem is that while the economy of the 1920s was a booming economy, it was doing quite well. It was doing quite well because of the sale of luxury goods, primarily things like cars and radios and a variety of other electric devices. Electricity was beginning, the, the web of electricity was beginning to flow throughout uh, the United States and electricity was becoming very, very common in much of America at this time. And so these electrical devices, which made life better, enriched your life, but weren't really necessary for you. These will be the things, will be the first that uh, things that people will stop buying. When you have a choice between either uh, buying food for yourself and your children or buying a new radio, well, you buy the food. So those industries that were making these goods where they employed lots of people, they have to shutter their factories. Those people who are making good wages are thrown out. No money. Can't buy things. And again, you have this multiplier effect through the economy. Another problem, of course, is the banks in the United States themselves. Just as we've seen with the housing crisis only a few years ago, where banks were loaning out money to anybody with a heartbeat, basically to buy homes, because if you are able to make your payments on those homes, well and good. That's good money for the banks. But if you can't, then the banks can foreclose and take the house. And because real estate always goes up, the bank has made a profit on foreclosing and taking that home because it can now sell it at a higher price. It can make money. Whether you make payments or whether they have to foreclose, they can make money. So it didn't matter. 
But of course, they didn't reckon on the vast numbers of individuals whose homes would be foreclosed upon, which would cause the real estate market to collapse and housing prices go down dramatically. So uh, the same sort of thing happens during the 1920s and into the 1930s in that banks are going to make a lot of loans, especially in the 1920s, to people who are getting by because they've got a job, they're doing okay, hey, that's fine, we'll loan you out money to buy that new car, to get that new radio, whatever you need, you got a good job, not a problem. When they don't have a job, that money is no longer coming into the banks, the banks go bankrupt. People who had their life savings in those banks lose their life savings as well. There is nothing at that time that we know of today as a federal insurance where banks today are members of the federal deposit, where they pool their money together so that if any individual member of this pool of banks goes bankrupt, and individuals who have money in that bank can be repaid up to a certain amount, but it's like $250,000 or, or more. So it's more than pretty much anybody I know of who has money in the bank. Uh, they didn't have that. So if the bank went bankrupt, all your money was gone your entire life savings. So that can be pretty bad, pretty devastating for many in the country. What else happens during Hoover's presidency? Well, there are the developments of what come to be known um, as Hoovervilles, though they really shouldn't be. Again, Hoover isn't really responsible. The federal government really isn't responsible for the economic downturn at the time. And, um, but you got to blame somebody. Somebody has to be to blame for this. And the buck begins to flow upwards from city governments who are financially strapped for money, who don't have the money for anything anymore, that flows up to the state governments, and the state governments don't have any money anymore. They There are just too many people out of work. They just don't have the money anymore. So it flows upward. And the last step in the process in a, in a republic is the federal government. So the last person that all of this falls at the foot of is the federal government, the president. So, uh, Hoovervilles, which were places where people who had been thrown out of their homes, they couldn't make uh, their house payments anymore or their rental payments or whatever, have to make do with uh, whatever they can find. Tents or uh, creating uh, ramshackle buildings with uh, boards and bailing wire or whatever they can, living out in the open, basically. Homeless. Men, women, children. Entire families. Uh, one of the problems uh, for veterans is that... Uh, actually, you have to remember that Recessions in the United States and in pretty much every country in the world occur on a regular basis. There are good times and there are bad times. And in all of the previous economic recessions of the United States, they have managed to right themselves eventually, whether it took a short time or a longer period of time. They all generally corrected themselves eventually. And Republicans of the time believed that 
this was no different, that it would eventually write itself. And the federal government didn't need to do anything and really shouldn't do anything because it might make matters worse by interfering because the economy is so complicated and complex and just so big that interfering with it would be to interfere with the free market and it might interfere with a recovery. So by and large, they didn't really do a whole lot. But that isn't to say that Hoover does nothing. Hoover actually does begin a process of moving towards using the federal government in creating a number of public works to put people into jobs, to get money into the economy. Now, Hoover and Republicans at the time really didn't believe in just giving money out from the government, that that weakened people, that people only became strong when they were self-reliant, when they did what they needed to do themselves. You can feed a man today, but if you teach him to fish, they can feed themselves for the rest of their lives. That was kind of the ideology that they had at that time. But Hoover will begin a process of creating large federal government projects like the Grand Coulee Dam or the, the Hoover Dam. Uh, its name has changed back and forth a couple of different times. I don't even remember what it is called today. So he doesn't do nothing. But uh, certainly he doesn't do as much as some were calling for the federal government to do, as the federal government was the last step where something could be done. City governments were being overwhelmed, state governments were being overwhelmed because of all of this, and the federal government was in the minds of some the last tool that could be used in the arsenal to help the economy and the American people. Though the Republicans are not all that willing to go as far down that path as some wanted them to. But in either case, the Bonus Army March. These are American veterans who had been promised a bonus in the 1940s, a few years down the road yet, bonus cash, but they said that if they could get a part of that now, they didn't want it all, but a part of it now, they could then make their home payments. They could have enough to, to feed their kids. They could. It would basically be a way to pump money into the economy. But the government didn't want to do that. They said, no, we said in the 40s, you, you've got another decade or more before you're going to be able to get that money. We just don't have it. It's not like we can just print money and just hand it out to just anybody and everybody. So some of those veterans having gone to Washington to show to the politicians there that they were in desperate need will have no way to get back home after their hopes had been crushed in getting money. So they'll stay in Washington, and they'll create a Hooverville there. And this will be a public eyesore and certainly a political thorn in the side of Hoover. So he will authorize the United States military to remove them, and under General Douglas MacArthur, the United States military will remove them. A number of people will be injured in this. Tear gas will be used, that type of thing. I don't recall anybody actually dying as a result of this, but uh, there may well have been. But this little Hooverville in Washington, D.C. will be swept away. 
And with that, we will uh, pick up with the uh, 1934 presidential election in which we will have the Democrats versus the Republicans and a whole new platform of what to do during the Great Depression. So, uh, thank you, and uh, that's it.